All right. You've been spared so far, and now we're going to dwell a little bit into a couple of numbers. So bear with me, okay? Break is going to be in... I got more time, right? 15, 15 minutes. And I'm going to ask some of you randomly afterwards about my presentation. So pay attention. So quickly about uh, my person and what I'm doing. So just have to figure out the right button here, if it's this one or this one. Okay, so first of all, I just do this as a side job here. Actually, I like guitars and I like cars. And this is just, you know, a means for me to make money to afford my expensive hobbies. I play in a tribute band. I'm not going to name the band that we are covering. But I'm also a statistician and psychologist, so I managed to complete my studies. I did my PhD with Professor Mark Griffiths who is going to um, be on digitally uh, later on. I published about 40 plus peer-reviewed studies. Actually, this year I'm scratching on my record, so I'm going to hopefully manage to publish 10 peer-reviewed studies this year. And they're all about you know, player tracking, player monitoring. So everything I do is basically really related to real-world data from real-world gamblers. And happy for you to um, pick some of my studies. We can exchange a little bit, you know, um, of course, um, also, also digitally. So you see it's all about, you know, limit setting, self-exclusions, play breaks. So everything that you could possibly find out if you were monitoring a player online, if you had the data available. So with the online gambling and online sports betting, we are in a unique position. Why? Because we know exactly what somebody is doing, when they play, when they wager, how much they wager, when they log in, when they log out, etc., etc. And in the beginning, of course, a couple of years ago, so the idea came up about player monitoring, so understanding player behavior, maybe finding out if I know exactly somebody's playing pattern, maybe I can even figure out if somebody shows addictive patterns, right, if they play more than they actually could afford. Maybe this is possible. So one of the first studies that we did is we asked players, how much do you think you gambled? And then we compare it with the actual spend. And so not surprisingly, we found out that many players underestimate the losses and they overestimate the winnings. So when you ask them, how much do you think you spent, how much you think you deposited last, whatever, 30 days, 60 days, 90 days, then very often they have no idea how much they gambled. That's why personalized feedback is important, right? So how can you expect somebody to gamble consciously, to make, they call it, an informed choice if they have no idea what to do? So this is sort of, you know, one of the foundations that study and others, of course, that sort of, you know, led to regulators across Europe to introduce, cust cust you know, mandatory custom interactions. So let's say in Germany now, um, if a player logs into their account, what does the operator need to do? They need to tell the player at that very moment how much they spent lately, right? A pop-up comes up informing the player, okay, that's what you did so far, that's how much you lost, that's how, that's how much you deposited. And all of that, of course, is driven by the research which shows, okay, players have no idea. So in order to make them aware of their gambling, operators need to inform players at all, point, at all times about their gambling behavior. So you might have also have heard about pop-up messages, real, real, you know, uh, real-time messages, and we are absolutely familiar with it, right? Because everybody does it. So every site tries to make you aware of their products at each point of time. You get pop-ups all the time, nudging you uh, to the, about this product, this product, you know, advertising a new holiday destination, whatever, even listening to your phone, et cetera, et cetera. So of course, we thought, that in gambling, so if somebody is gambling, it might also help telling them, okay, look, now you've spent an hour gambling, would you like to stop, right? Technologically, no problem, no brainer, it's possible. The operators have the real-time capacities, it can be done. So I published two studies, and actually, I dare to say, nothing else has been published since then, when we informed players after they had gambled an hour, actually it was a thousand games, that they had just done so. So we told them, okay, you've played for an hour, would you like to stop? So what do you think, out of 
a thousand players how many actually stopped to play once they saw the pop-up. Any estimates? Three? That's 10, uh, 70. <laughs> so it was about 0.7% of players who stopped to play. That's what you see in this chart. I won't go into detail, but you see like the spike, the blue spike are, the, are the, basically that's the, you know, a thousand games played and that's the percent of players who stopped to play. So very, very, very few. And then what we did is we enhanced the pop-up message. So we thought, okay, let's, you know, build in additional information into the pop-up message. So let's also sort of suggest players, okay, you played a thousand games, very few other players do that. We call it normative feedback. We also change the buttons, etc., etc. And what we managed is we doubled the effect. So you see the red dotted line is the, you know, sort of um, old pop-up and the blue one is the enhanced pop-up. We doubled the effect, but still very few players stop to gamble. So out of 1,000, 70 stopped before and 130 stopped after, right? So still the effect was very low, however, it improved. But so far, I mean, to this day, pop-up messages, there hasn't been any research that would sort of substantiate the impact of pop-up messages with respect to stopping gambling. What we find is that if you have a pop-up message and you have a link in it to a limit setting, to self-assessment, that sort of imp improve increases the percent of players who choose limits, who self-exclude to certain things. But once they have been gambling so long, they are, you know, so sort of in the zone, sort of out of control, that it's rarely that they stop just because of the pop-up message. So what we did next is that we thought pop-up message might be one thing, but the other way basically could be to block somebody from gambling completely, right? So that's also like common practice with operators that if somebody gambles for an extended period of time, they are blocked. So typically those, you know, mandatory uh, breaks or cooldowns, whatever you want to call them, they last for 90 seconds. So somehow the industry had agreed, okay, you know, if we block somebody because of extensive gambling, because they deposited a lot, they gambled for hours, we're going to cool them down, so we, we're going to sort of, you know, um, lock them out for 90 seconds. And we thought, okay, why 90 seconds? You know, pff, who came up with this? Nobody knew. And we thought, okay, let's, you know, try different periods of time. You know, what, what's, what's more effective? So what we did is we tried out 90 seconds, 5 minutes, and 15 minutes. And then you might ask yourself, okay, how do you measure the impact, right? What's better, what's worse? What's your sort of target variable? What we did is we measured the time it took them after the cooldown ended to return back to gambling, right? Would they come back five seconds later, a minute later, right? Or not come back at all? So what we found then is that the 15 minute play break basically led to um, longest sort of you know interruption of play on top of the co of the of the cooldown so once the play break the mandatory cooldown lasted 15 minutes we found that a lot of players changed activity probably it's too long to just wait in front of the computer and you know see that the, the countdown until you can gamble again so they go do something else of course there are limitations to this they could just switch over to another site that's of course something that you can determine that you can't measure if you work with the data from one operator the next study that we did was again a cooldown of um, a sort of mandatory play break but this time it lasted for 60 minutes so that's a uk based operator they are working with our system, and what they do is once somebody deposits 10 times on a day, which is a lot, right, 10 times depositing on a day, then they block those people for 60 minutes. And again, in this study, we found that the, in, that the sort of mandatory play break really worked because very few of those players actually returned to gamble for the remainder of the day. So here you see, this is like a, a time series you don't need, we don't need to go into detail. This is the number of players who deposit 10 times on a day. That's sometime 20, um, July to September 2021, the data. And every, basically, every data point is a day. And then the y-axis, it's the number of players who deposited 10 times on a day, which is a lot. That's why the number, of course, is small. And the dashed vertical line is the point of time when they introduced the mandatory play break. So, 
switch to the next slide. Okay. And what we see here is the dashed line, remember, is the point of time when they introduced a 60-minute play break. So once somebody deposits 10 times, they are cut off for 60 minutes. And on the y-axis now, we have the number of percent of players who deposit an, at least an 11th time. So they deposited 10 times and then an 11th time. And we see here that this line shows, you know, a quite significant change. It drops down. So what we found is that the percent of players who deposited in 11th times sort of shrunk from what was like 80 to 20 percent or something like that. So around 80 percent of the players who were faced with this block for an hour did not return to gamble on the same day. We didn't find any differences the next day, so basically those players who are blocked continued to gamble the same way the next day, the same way, basically two, three weeks. So it didn't have a long-term effect, but it had a short-term effect. And I'd argue this is important because this is when they are out of control, right? When they have deposited 10 times, then, I mean, they are out of control, they have lost a significant amount of money, and it's time to stop them. Of course, you could argue, why not stop them after they deposited three times, two times, four times, something like that. There will be another panel today about sustainability and responsible gaming, and I just quickly wanted to bring, bring that up. So in this study, what we did is we tried to figure out or try to correlate responsible gambling behavior measured via voluntary limit setting with sustainability. So what did we do? We compared players who chose to limit themselves voluntarily to players who did not limit themselves, and we looked one year into the future and we checked how many of them were still gambling, right? So I'd call this law, could, you can, you know, like that's called, I mean, in business you call it retention or the reverse is churn rate, right? How many players do you still have with you, with your site? How many are still sort of gambling with the operator? And what we found is that those players who had limited themselves were more likely to still be gambling in one year time. And in this table here, you see like 10 groups, 10 rows. That's, so what, what they did is we split the players up in terms of intensity, right? Low intensity player, high intensity player. And at the bottom row, the group number 10, we see 48 of players, 45.8% of players were still gambling in a year time out of those who did not set limits. And among those who set limits, 58% of players were still gambling. So you see every column, the ones who set limits were more likely to still be gambling in a year time. Which means that obviously there is a correlation between responsibility and sustainability and loyalty. Of course, there are lots of questions, right? Can you make somebody choose a limit? Or is it something, you know, that you can convince some players of? There are some researchers, some operators who strongly believe, you know, mandatory, uh, mandatory spend limits are important because you can make somebody choose a limit or self-exclude. Those are basically distinct groups of people. Or can you, you know, if you can convince, if you can nudge somebody to choosing limits, then of course, this has larger um, impacts. So last but not least, I want to quickly talk about prediction of problem gambling because ultimately, who is a problem gambler, right? I mean, based on how they gamble, how they wager, how much they lose, how can you tell if somebody is a problem gambler? Because you can't interview every player, right? I mean, you can't find out if they are restless when they are gambling, if they have lied to family members, if they have, you know, stole money. I mean, all of, all of, all of those indicators, symptoms, like which are listed in the DSM or ICD-10. So ultimately, the operator can only find indications of problematic gambling, but they can never diagnose somebody. So now the question is, can you sort of find data or is sort of self-reported problem gambling really related to how somebody plays? So what we did in this study, we randomly selected 1,000 players from a UK based uh, website, from an online casino site, and we asked them the PGSI, so this is the so-called Problem Gambling Severity Index. It's nine questions about gambling, just like, okay, have you ever had problems with gambling? Has gambling caused you health issues? Has gambling caused you financial harm? Things like that. 
and then if you score a certain number of points, you are a problem gambler, right? That's the same questionnaire that's, been, that's used to basically um, have a, do a prevalent study or something like that. So what you see here, that's like a, you know, sort of a, a area, a rock curve, a receiver operating curve. What you see here, that it pr works quite well. So we found that if you can collect a sort of reliable uh, number of responses about self-reported problem gambling, you correlate it with their gambling behavior, it works quite well. And what's even more interesting is that we found it's not how much they lose or how much they deposit in total or how much they wager, but it's about the way they play, right? It's the behavior and not the absolute numbers. So the most predictive variables with respect to self-reported problem gambling were frequent session deposits. So if somebody deposits very often in a session, at least you know, more than once, then it's very likely that they are a self-reported problem gambler because it's simply a sign of loss of control, of, lo of, you know, of impulsivity, all those things that are indicative of problem gambling also from a clinical point of view. So we had two metrics that sort of stuck out here. It was frequent session depositing, and the other one was when they, when they always sort of emptied their account. So when they gambled, they always stopped to gamble only when they had zero euros or pounds on their account. So they never left anything on the account. They deposited, deposited. At some point of time, they may run out of money or had to run to the toilet or whatever, do something, go to work. But whenever, you know, we sort of computed the session, it always ended with zero money on the account. Coming back, sorry, one more minute, it's okay? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> so coming back to the last study, which was also sort of accepted a um, couple of days ago and will soon be published. We, this study was, was done with uh, the Dutch lottery, the Länderlandse Staatslotterei, which is now also a license holder for online casino there. And they call players or email to players. So this is not about a pop-up message or a message on the site, but they really call them up or email to them if they meet certain criteria. And we want you to know, does it have an impact, right? So if they call somebody, email to somebody, do they gamble more or do they gamble less? And not surprisingly, we found that they gamble less. So basically personalized calls and or emails led to less deposit volume, less wagering, less sort of gambling duration, like time on site, but the only thing which wasn't impacted was gambling frequency, so how often they play, right? So on how many different days, the 30 days after and before the call or the email they, they were playing. But otherwise, the impact, the emails and the, and the calls were significant, and also surprisingly, there was no difference between email and call. So one would imagine if, if you call somebody, you invest more into it, right? You, have, you build up maybe a per, sort of some sort of you know, uh, relationship with them, but the impact was as large as with the email, which of course, I mean, it's sort of supports and it's good because an email is cheaper, right? You can reach more people and ultimately it supports the hypothesis. So last but not least, we'll skip this one. What did we learn in those 15 minutes? Players often underestimate the losses. That's why feedback is important. They don't stop just because there is a pop-up message. Mandatory play breaks, so if they are blocked for a period of time, at least 15 minutes work. And responsible gaming, at least limit setting, correlates positively with loyalty, which is good, you know, for, of course, compliance across, you know, operators and regulators. And problem gambling behavior can be predicted. And if operators email or phone players, there seems to be a positive impact in a way that their expenses, spendings are lowered. Thank you. Thank you very much, Michael. Maybe you want to take some questions, if there are any. Sure. I haven't seen them on our app, but if there's a question, please let us know. Ah, look here. It's just in front of us. Thank you. Oh, tough question. <laughs> so what uh, actions have they uh, initiated on their own without being forced by law? 
I mean, I'd say over the last couple of years, maybe last three years, there has been like real, what is a domino effect that operators increasingly, you know, go beyond regulation and introduce responsible gambling measures because it's also something which, you know, lets them stand out, right? The, I mean, it's something that's specific to them. It's something they can also sort of, they realized it's also useful for brand recognition. Well, Thank may you. I ask a question, just directly? Please. <laughs> Thank you so much, Michael. Guess which kind of question I have for you. Did, did you notice any gender differences in all these measures? Did you have uh, different data? I mean, while, while, while your panel was on, I thought, hey, that would be a good paper. Because in every paper that I, that I, that I published, we always um, had gender and age available. But nobody ever you know, thought about doing a meta study, whether there are any differences. I mean, what you see is there are differences, of course, with respect to operators that are more emerging from the lottery sector, right? So there are some, like Norsk-Tipping, like Svenska Spell, like, um, like uh, Toto now, the Netherlands Lottery, which, you know, might not be entirely comparable to a typical privately run online casino. And of course, you have differences with respect to the type of games, like sports betting is more male-dominated slots. You know, you have a higher percentage of females. Restriction and the profile of gamblers too. This could be a good. Yeah. I took it mark to a good paper. Thanks. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you very much. Is there any more questions? On slide or maybe on uh, Confirians? Yes. Any thoughts for a new tool for protection? Well, you don't need a new tool. I have the best tool. <laughs> no, I mean, of course. I mean, anything. I mean, that could be things you know you couldn't imagine today for example there are really good tools out there which monitor um, you know player communication because that's something which went totally unnoticed so far right emails chats reading you know indicative um, indicative communication like you know begging for bonuses complaining etc etc there's very few there are very few studies out there um, less tools even but that could be something you know for for you know for future um, research. Okay, so this is it regarding all these questions. Thank you very much, uh, Michael. I think your findings are based on evidence, and that makes it so valuable. There are so many discussions what how, how effective measures are in order to protect players, but we can see if we analyze what you've done here what might be the best path to follow and what is not that expected, effective as expected. Thank you very much for sharing, sharing these Thanks. insights. Thanks.